Chapter 15 I was mad, Cole said, glancing nervously around the circle. When I went to the island, I wasn't thinking straight. I didn't realize you were all trying to help me. I thought sending me away was just your way of getting rid of me. I went there just to avoid jail. Cole struggled with his words. I... I know now I was wrong, and I know I can't go back to the island after what I did. That's okay. As he handed the feather to his mother, strong doubt showed in the eyes of the circle members. He had lied to them so often, they were numb to his words now. I know Cole has changed some, his mother began, her voice surprisingly strong. Since the attack, I've seen a difference in his attitude. For the first time, he's talked openly with me. I don't know what should happen to him now. I feel like I'm just trying to pick up the pieces myself. She dabbed at her eyes. I just hope there are pieces left to pick up. She handed the feather on. As each member spoke, nobody argued for Cole's release. Even Cole's lawyer spoke in terms of a reduced jail term for good behavior. Each circle member expressed regret for what had happened. All of them thought it was time to return the case to the courts. The only person to speak in Cole's defense was Garvey. I don't know what all happened on that island, he said, but there has been a change in Cole. Of that, I'm sure. Whatever we decide to do, I hope this change is allowed to continue. When Peter's lawyer received the feather, she held it indifferently beside her, as if it no longer held meaning. This whole thing has to stop now, she said strongly. No more. Too many people have suffered and paid a price on account of Cole Matthews. Maybe someday he'll find a way to be a productive member of society. For now, it's the welfare of society that must be considered. Two days on an island is hardly enough time to change someone. This circle needs to know that Peter Driscoll is not rehabilitating well, either physically or emotionally. He has slurred speech and diminished coordination. This is Cole's fault. It's not something Cole can fix, but he can face the consequences. Even now, he refuses to admit the complete truth. I understand he claims that a pure white bear attacked him. Does he really expect anybody to believe such a thing? I'm told no such bear exists in the area he was sent. The lawyer spoke firmly. Circle justice has proven to be a waste of time. It's time for Cole to face real consequences. She handed the feather back to the keeper. The keeper ran her fingers over the feather to straighten it, as if trying to fix the damage suffered by the circle. When she finished, she turned to Edwin. Do you have anything to share? Edwin nodded. Can I ask Cole to help me with a demonstration? When the keeper nodded, Edwin stood and walked to the open end of the room. He motioned for Cole to follow him. Every eye followed their movements. Okay, the Clinket elder began. Let's pretend this line is life. He pointed out a seam in the linoleum flooring that crossed the room. He placed Cole on one side and stood himself on the other. Cole and I are going to walk the length of this line as if going through life together. This line represents a bad path that I want Cole to move away from. I have two ways to get him away. Edwin began leaning into Cole as they walked forward. Cole instinctively pushed back. They walked forward, pushing on each other harder and harder. Soon they were both struggling. When they reached the other end, Edwin had succeeded in pushing Cole only a couple of feet away from the line. Breathing hard, Cole eyed Edwin with distrust. Okay, let's walk the other direction and try to do the same thing in a different way, Edwin said. As Cole turned, suddenly Edwin rushed at him and shoved him hard with both hands. The push sent Cole sprawling to the floor, yards away from the line. Startled, Cole scrambled to get to his feet. Edwin offered a hand and helped him up. Cole fought the urge to hit him or shove the elder. You caught me off guard, he said. Edwin smiled slightly. Yes, life does that a lot. He turned to the group. People change two ways, with slow, persistent pressure or with a single and sudden traumatic experience. That's why people often change so much when they have a near-death experience. I believe something significant happened to Cole on that island. Six months ago, he would have come up off the floor swinging after a push like that. Edwin paused, rubbing his rough hand over his stubbled chin. And yes, 
Maybe people don't change completely overnight, but I do believe they can change direction overnight. Facing in a new direction is the first step of any new journey. How can we be sure Cole has found a new direction? The keeper asked. We've heard this claim before. He still claims he saw a white bear. Isn't that proof he is still lying to us? Edwin turned to Cole as they returned to the circle. Did you see a spirit bear? Cole thought a moment. He could lie, and they would all believe him. Or he could tell the truth, and they would all think he still lied. You don't need to think about the truth, said Edwin. I saw a spirit bear, and I touched it, Cole blurted out. A thin smile pulled at Edwin's lips. That should be all the proof you need, exclaimed Peter's lawyer, although she no longer held the feather. That should be the last time this circle needs to sit here and listen to lies. Edwin spoke. Three weeks ago, the crew of a fishing boat returning to Drake claimed they had seen a white bear on an island near where Cole was banished. I might have questioned the report if one of the crew hadn't been Bernie. Who's Bernie? asked the keeper. Edwin waved a hand. Just a friend, but I've known Bernie my whole life, and he's not a man to lie. I don't care if there's a black bear, a white bear, or a yellow one with green polka dots, said Peter's lawyer. What matters is that Cole broke his contract with the circle, and now it's time for him to pay. We give him chance after chance, and at the same time we tell him he has to face the consequences of his actions. The lawyer raised her voice almost to a shout. No more chances. Cole breathed slowly. He felt strong enough now to face whatever happened. He was strong enough to not blame anybody else. He could admit that he was no longer in control, and he knew he could tell the truth. But could he control his anger? Even now it smoldered. The keeper spoke with a rigid voice. We can't just build another cabin, buy more supplies, and start over as if nothing ever happened. Circle justice isn't blind. It is about facing consequences. Why don't we just send him away to Disney World for a year? said Peter's lawyer sarcastically. This time there would be no free ride, Edwin said. If we send him back to the island, Cole would build his own cabin and pay for every penny of the supplies by selling things he owns and values. It would be much harder than before. The keeper spoke with resignation. We have no way of knowing if Cole is over his anger. Cole motioned for the feather. I know I had a chance once and messed it up, so I don't expect to go back to the island. He shook his head. Edwin told me once that anger was a memory never forgotten. He's right. When I was mauled, I didn't get over my anger. I still feel it, even now, sitting here in this chair. But I've also learned it takes a stronger person to ask for help and to tell the truth. I am telling the truth when I say I saw a spirit bear. During the following weeks, Cole mentally prepared himself for the inevitable. He imagined attending a trial and hearing the verdict, guilty. He imagined being led in handcuffs from the courtroom and for the first time being locked into a real jail cell. The hardest thing was to imagine being locked up day after day, week after week, month after month. While Cole worked through his feelings, he exercised. For long hours each morning and evening, he lay on a small bed, swinging his arms and legs, arching his back, and stretching to keep his body from stiffening. Midday, he worked out on weights in the center group area. He found himself growing stronger, and he found that when he had angry thoughts, he could exercise himself into a sweaty frenzy until pain from his joints drove away his thoughts and left him spent. No amount of exercise, however, could bring strength back into Cole's right arm and hand. It was all he could do to lift a shirt. Garvey explained to Cole after the second gathering that the circle would continue meeting without him. He wouldn't say exactly why, but he did say that Edwin had remained in Minneapolis to attend the meetings. During the next two weeks, Edwin stopped by to visit several times. He never said much, but he studied Cole the way a person looks at a chessboard planning the next move. When he spoke, he asked pointed questions without explaining himself. After each visit, he left without saying goodbye. All he ever mumbled was, gotta go. Nathaniel Blackwood stopped by unexpectedly one day to announce he would no longer be Cole's lawyer. Cole's father had refused to pay additional legal fees, and now a public defender would be assigned. 
Barely two days later, Garvey and Edwin stopped by together. They sat down on Cole's bed and stared at him. What are you staring at? Cole asked. So you think you're changed, huh? Grunted Edwin. What difference does it make? Said Cole. He looked down at his feet. I feel different. How so? Said Garvey. It's hard to explain, Cole said. You better try. Edwin's voice left no room for discussion. Cole quit trying to think of answers with his head and instead let his feelings answer. After I was mauled, when I thought I was going to die, I felt like just a plant or something, like I wasn't important. I didn't know why I even existed. That scared me. I know it doesn't make any sense, but I realized that I was dying, and I had never really even lived. Nobody trusted me. I had never loved anybody, and nobody had ever really loved me. Edwin and Garvey exchanged a glance. So how did that change things? Garvey asked. I don't know, Cole said, emotions welling up from deep inside. I really don't know. I just know that my dad's not going to ever come back to say he's sorry. Even if he did, he couldn't change what he did. He couldn't take away the memories. So you think this is all his fault, huh? Asked Edwin. No, Cole said, his voice trembling. Mom said his parents beat him up too. I don't know where the anger all started. All I know is I don't ever want to have a kid and beat him up. Cole wiped out his eyes. What makes you think you're better than your dad or his parents? Asked Garvey. I'm no better, Cole said. I'm worse. Dad never ended up in jail. Not yet, Garvey said. So if you are worse, what makes you think things can be different for you? Cole swallowed hard. Maybe they can't be. Maybe I'll never change. All I know is that things happened on the island that I can't explain. I've never been so scared. When Edwin and Garvey didn't answer, Cole found himself irritated. What's with all the questions? He asked. You two are wasting your time now. Are we? Edwin asked. Cole fought back the tears blurring his vision. You two are the only ones who ever cared about me, he blurted. It's not like I don't appreciate what you're doing, but I screwed everything up. I'm going to jail. Can't you see that? Why don't you just leave me alone now and quit wasting your time? Garvey cleared his throat strongly and rubbed at his neck. Edwin and I are probably the two biggest fools alive. Or maybe we remember our own pasts too well, Edwin added. We still believe in you and think there's hope, Garvey said. Because of that, we've stuck our necks out so far we feel like two giraffes. Last night, we convinced the Circle to release you to our custody. What do you mean, your custody? Cole asked. You're going back to the island, Edwin said.